Tim's office at pinballrebel.com. And I would like to introduce to you uh, Butch and Eric from Jersey Jack Pinball. And let's give them a big check of round of applause. Hey guys, I'm Eric. Um, I'm an electrical engineer with Jack. I just started working for him back in January. Uh, today we're going to be showing you a video. Then we're going to be going through a presentation on the manual and the play field. And then get the satellites aligned. We're going to get Jack on Skype. And have to talk to us for a little while. So. Give me a little bit of your background, Eric. What, what you're doing with the company and all. So I just started with Jack. Um, I recently finished my undergraduate in electrical engineering and then my master's in mechanical engineering at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I've been in the game industry since I was four or so. <laughs> my dad. He wasn't much shorter then either. <laughs> uh, my dad is an operator in Wisconsin. Some of you might know him, Kingpin Games. Uh, my dad's in North. So when I handed Jack my resume, he seemed pretty happy to bring me on board. Eric's part of the, the new breed, and we were just talking about that with one of the customers up here, the, the direction that the company's taking, getting some new guys involved, you know, the old designers, the classics, they're not going to be around forever, so, you know, we need to start passing some of that knowledge on. So he's training under Joe Balser and Jim Thornton. Um, my name is Butch Peel, and I love pinball. <laughs> As it basically says it all. Um, playing the games. Uh, restoring the games, touching up play fields, repairing printed circuit boards, um, playing, watching other people play, talking about it. I mean, this, I'm in my element here. I just love it with the, all of the people here that, that have the same passion that I do. Um, I'm an electrical engineer also. I work part-time for Jack right now. I still work with my full-time job. I'm an um, electrical engineer at the U.S. Army Research Laboratory, White Sands Missile Range. I'm a civil servant, work for the U.S. Army. I've been out there for 28 years in June and looking to retire here in the next couple of years and, and kind of come full time with Jack and, and uh, doing something, you know, the opportunity of a lifetime, like I call it. I got to pinch myself each and every day. I mean, these, getting to work with these guys and, and uh, be involved with something that I'm so passionate about, it's just, it's, it's hard to explain, it's hard to put into words. Um, I'm working on the manual right now. And, um, two years ago, I met Jack at this very show. When he started talking about it, he had just announced the starting up of his company about three months earlier. Um, got up on the stage and just had all kinds of energy, a lot of excitement. Um, I could tell that he was going to build something spectacular. I said, told my wife just before we came to the show, she's a big Wizard of Oz fan, and I told her, uh, I just I don't see how I can afford one of those. And, and, uh, when I heard him talk, I, I went back afterwards and I told her, one way or another, we gotta make that make that work. <laughs> you know, there's a payment plan. She's like, I have I have the 250 down payment here in my purse, you know, we can do it right now. <laughs> so yeah, we were on board immediately. Um, soon after that I started on the, the Wizard of Oz forum. You know, reading and checking posts and adding in where I put my two cents and um, Jack started some kind of a, a post about his uh, his slogan for his new company, you know, he'd like to get some suggestions. And I was sitting in my parents' house, I was there for the weekend, drinking a cup of coffee with my slippers on, and I thought of one and typed it in, and it turned out he really liked it, and he trademarked it and made it the company slogan, and that's the jack of all trades, master of fun. Um, so that's on all the pinball machines now, something I was very proud of. And I thought, you know, boy, that's, that's really cool. Now I've, I've made my mark in pinball, you know, and that's, that's really neat. Well, then I started emailing him and talking to him. I do board repair through the mail, um, circuit board repair. So I told him, you know, have you, have you given any thought to uh, how you're going to repair your boards in, in this game? You're going to have a new system and, and uh, you know, maybe I could become like a factory authorized uh, place to, to repair your boards. And the more we emailed back and forth, the more he saw how much passion I had for, the, for this company and for this uh, project and for pinball in general. And, Next thing I know, he's, he's wanting me on board as part of the team. And that, like I say, I gotta pinch myself every day. I mean, I've been going to all these shows and meeting all these great people and sitting alongside the Joe Balsers and, and the Eric's and, and you know, just, just having the ball, having the, the time of my life. And I, I'm so, so thankful, so grateful, and so enthusiastic. 
it's hard to hard to put into words again. So we're going to start with a, a video. This was our, our Christmas open house. Jack opened the doors of the factory on the December 14th of last year, and he uh, invited a, a bunch of people to come, customers, anybody who wanted to come in, basically. Well, one of the guys was a, on his polygon.com. He made a video, and he interviewed some people, and, and uh, Jack wanted us to show this video to start. So without any further ado, we'll go to that. that really great ball and beat you. It's a give and take with it. It's, it beats you up and you beat it up in a way, but I think it's in a respectful way. You know, you come back again and say, I'm gonna get this thing and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna master this and I'm gonna get better at it. Now, the more you play, the better you get. So that's pretty cool. We're gonna go see Jersey Jack Pinball. Uh, they're working on a new table for the Wizard of Oz. This is pretty a pretty big deal. There haven't been a lot of pinball tables made uh, since the 80s. Only Stern Pinball has been making them, I guess, the last decade or so. So this is gonna be all brand new and we're gonna be one of the first people to see it. For many years, pinball was at the top of its game, so to speak, but of course, like all things, it suffered a slump. Kids got into the video games and uh, the home video. But in the last several years, I've seen it make a big comeback because of all the theme games. And, it's, and if you want a theme game, The Wizard of Oz, there couldn't be anything better than that. So I think this is going to be the start of a real renaissance for pinball. In 1975, I took a, a temporary job, what I thought would be a temporary job, repairing electromechanical pinball machines. And here I am, you know, 37 years later. What we decided... Just... The second the buffer here. This worked just fine a few minutes ago. <laughs> then he broke the eight pinball and he made a presentation about pinball again. Yeah. He owned arcades and we had pinball machines in my basement my whole life and all that, so I was very exposed to it. You'll see my son here and you'll see my daughter here. You know what? Jen works for the company, she's worked for my companies for several years. 
Jack graduates from uh, Westchester University on Sunday, and after the Christmas break, he starts with the company. And I didn't know that that would be a dynamic. I didn't know that that would even be something in the thought process, that they, they would be involved. But it is very cool. Big family affair. <laughs> and then my uncle works in the back, my cousin's husband as well, so they do parts and everything. So. If you have any links in the chain that don't believe in what you're doing, or they don't want to work really hard at it, not going to work. If you can't have fun working in a pinball factory, you can't have fun anywhere. And they have to have fun doing this stuff. One day they were asking about um, slogans for the company, and I put on there Jack of All Trades, Master of Fun, and he really liked it. He licensed it, and it's on all the games now. So that kind of got me in the door. And I started talking to him about doing board repair and things like that. And he saw that I had a real passion for, for the game, for love, a love for pinball. And, and wanted to, to be part of something like this in the startup, so he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime. I found out about Jersey Jack from the um, Spooky Pinball uh, podcast the day he announced that he was going to make Wizard of Oz pinball machine. Even though I wasn't really in the, ever in the market for a new in-box pinball machine, I, I figured, you know, what, what the hell? And everybody knows Wizard of Oz. You can't go anywhere without a Wizard of Oz reference anymore on TV and things like So this is just fantastic that you can you know, it's be so recognizable. We want to have a lot of mechanical toys on the game, interaction with the ball with toys. We wanted to have a loaded game, so we had to do a wide body game to give it more room, give Joe Balls and the other guys room to design and be free. This is what happens when the guy that owns the company doesn't say no, you can't do that. You know, the word was yes. And how? Usually you have a product, and then you sell the product. So this is like we had an idea, and so many people, you know, had faith in us. I felt really great that people would believe in me and then other people in our team and that we would sell a thousand games that nobody ever played or nobody ever saw. I think this game can do a lot more than any other game probably you know yet. I can just really see like you know kids having a lot of fun with this when they come over just on, on the surface of just how, how it looks. If they, you know they're not gonna know about rules really or you know how deep the game is or you know how far they are along the quest you know they just like ah! You know, I think they're going to really like it. You know. Pinball really is poised for a comeback, but it's poised for new generations to discover it. And our game, when you see it, you know it's a brand new game because it's it's got all this striking eye candy that right away you walk over to it and everybody has this holy cow moment. They say, I got to play this. I got to put money in this and play it. If you want to know what my favorite pinball machine up to now was, it's the Adams Family, actually. But this, I mean, I really can't judge this just from looking at it for a little while, but this might be bigger than the Adams Family. Who knows? The guy was not a paid spokesman. That's <laughs> <laughs> test. You should have seen back on after I dropped it in the floor a minute ago. Sorry, Ken. Um, another thing, thank, I forgot to a little remiss in starting out to thank Ken and, and uh, Ed and Paul and all the rest of the organizers for having us here. Um, they, they did a great job. I mean, this, this place is huge or what? I think I crossed through three zip codes and maybe a time zone on my way from my hotel room over here. So, yeah, I mean, this is a massive hotel. I've I, I never seen the likes. Uh, I apologize for us, uh, you know, Projecting here on Grandma's bedspread up on the wall. It's <laughs> the best we could do. Uh, we f figured that was better than using the little screen over here in the corner. So you know, bear with us. Uh, things are a little less crisp than I hoped. I hope some of the drawings that I'm going to show you can still be able to see things well. But uh, if not, I'll, I'll fill the time with some words, and, and we'll get through it together. So let's see. I want to start with the uh, with the open house and some pictures that I took. I took a camera there. And um, I wanted to talk to everybody and get some get some ideas. So the the factory floor here, these things automatically go up. I thought you said you knew how to use PowerPoint. Please. When I say next, you hit. Okay. Back up. There you go. Okay. Now leave it alone. Stay. Okay. Good. These young guys, you get it takes takes a while to get them to train. But here's the six games that we had set up basically on the end of our, our assembly line here. We had uh, play fields galore and, and various levels of assembly. Um, a lot of people from the factory were there to ask questions too and, and get answers. Um, we were 
We're waiting. One of the things we're waiting on right in here in this area was uh, the RGB LED boards. And there's uh, cabinets galore. The guy packs these up in a big old trailer from, um, I guess it's Galena, Illinois. Yeah, thank you, sir. And drives them all the way out to the factory. Um, next. There's our parts. I mean, if you look, you can see through here in a better resolution, but th this is a whole big old square area with, you know, parts stacked from ceiling to floor. There's your back box assembly line. This is where all the LCDs are put in, the brackets, the light bar across the back, and those are all added onto the cabinet line where everything's put together, um, minus the play field, and then we'll drop those in at the very end. Some of the faces you with related to the company, that's Jack and his lovely wife, Joanne. She keeps him grounded, you know, make sure he takes out trash and does the things us normal men do. He doesn't get too big of a head. Wives are great for that, by the way, aren't they? His lovely uh, uh, brother-in-law, Vinny. Vinny is married to Joanne's sister. He does parts for us in the, pro in the uh, company. Next. These are our two uh, clerical, the, the Jen and Katie. They're in the front office, they're answering the phones when you call in with questions or orders or you know, when's my game coming and those sorts of things. These are the ladies that you'll most likely interface with. On the factory floor, this is Ken Holland. He's our production manager. Um, Drew Maniscalco, he's like head of the sales and things. He goes to the big show and sells the games overseas. And all. Jim Thornton, he kind of hides away from the cameras. You don't see his picture on the website and things like that. There's a reason for that, because every time he takes a picture, he looks like an axe murderer or something. <laughs> he says, you should see my uh, Facebook page picture. And I looked at it, I'm like, holy cow. You gotta be kidding me. But Jim has done so much for this company. I mean, the guy does everything from, you know, he's ordered and purchased and priced every single um, <coughs> item that's in the game, every part that's in the game orders the, the right number, he's got the, the bill of materials, he's been controlling that from the very beginning. He's you know constantly interfacing with vendors, you know, why is this part not right? You know, why, when is this stuff coming in? Why is this late? Those sorts of things. I mean just, and then he does technical support. He's on the phone talking to guys that are at the distributors working through some issues that they have. I mean the man does everything and he's he's really he's the one who built the original I and mean, he's a big troubleshooter. The guy really knows what's going on with football. The big trouble causer sometimes too, but that, we won't get into that. Uh, Joe Balser down here in the corner, he's a direct, and uh, Jim's title in the company is Director of Product, um, uh, product Development. Um, this is uh, Joe Balser, the man who designed the game. He's also the Director of Mechanical Engineering. Eric's working under him. He's you know, responsible for the Simpsons Pinball Party and you know, uh, great games back from the Data East days. A lot of the, you know, the Apollo 13s with the 13 ball, multi ball, those sorts of things. Um, really talented, a great guy. This is uh, some guys that work on the factory floor. This is Steve Zamonski. He's been, he and Larry Apici have been working with Jack with PinballSales.com for many, many, many years. Um, that's his son, Jack Jr. He's been with Jack obviously all of his life. <laughs> this is Sal, the, the, uh, um, husband of, I gotta get all the family relations right here. Jen was talking about her cousin's husband works. That, that's Sal. Her, that, and that's uh, Vinny's daughter's husband. <laughs> Vinny's daughter. Yeah, I got that. It's starting to sound like Jersey Shore or something. <laughs> <laughs> or Sopranos, maybe? I don't know. Okay, well, one of the things that he had on the, set out for the, uh, for the, wow, this is kind of rough, but. Looks like cave dwelling drawings, but we'll, we'll get through this. Um, he had a bunch of drawings that they had done for the game as it progressed, hanging on the wall of the break room, and, and people would come in and you could kind of go from panel to panel and see how things progressed. I thought those were kind of cool. I photographed them and then uh, put them in this presentation. There's a few things I just wanted to you know, kind of show you that have changed during the, the development. Next. So the, you know, this is our uh, castle mini play field. And if you look at the game out there, you see a much more you know, cup-shaped uh, rescue target setup than we've got here. This, this wasn't quite as uh, pronounced, this curve in here you know, for the shot to make that. That becomes a more of a makeable looping 
sort of shot, but this was just real early on. And then I put the, I think I put this hole in here just to drive people crazy. It's like, what in the heck is that going to be? Whoa, going to be like a gobble hole, or is there going to be some kind of a, an up kicker there? Or, you know. So yeah, a lot of a lot of different. Uh, I think maybe early on that was the way it was going to get up onto the play field. I don't know, feed it to this flipper. You see the rainbow targets over here in this area of the play field. You see when you're early on, you, you're, you're trying to determine what the angles are going to be to make the shots correct, you know, give you a little more access maybe to some of these upper. If you don't make this so steep, you can get to these shots a little easier. Um, you know, some of the things that, that play into early development of a play field. And then they, down in this area of the play field, you see these, these four targets weren't always B-A-L-L. -L. I'm glad they changed that because ETAF makes no sense at all. I, I don't know why they would do that. It's a good idea to change that. Um, again, the different angles here to make those where the ball travels across the play field. You know, anybody that plays pinball knows that once that ball starts going left and right across the play field, you're going to have to do something to keep it from going out the alley lanes or, or, or you're in deep trouble. The witch targets originally were going to be three separate targets. They had some idea that maybe you hit this target when the witch popped up the first time, you'd smack that center target. If you hit it direct center, she'd melt immediately. And if you hit the side ones first, then it, she'd melt just a little at a time and you'd have to work your way to killing her. Next. And then down here, you'll notice also in the, in the upper corner up there, Oz, early on, they knew those two lanes were going to be the Oz lanes. But oddly enough, the, the licensing with the Wizard of Oz is so complicated that Oz, the great and powerful type licensing, is different from the Wizard of Oz from 1939. So you get all these uh, crazy things like, you know, this can't be Oz up here, it's got to be the Wizard of Oz. So you notice whenever it says Oz on the game out there, it says the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of little letters, but Oz. So, you know, you can't just have Oz by itself, just one of those little quirks you get. Here's a, a little bit later drawing showing the play field layout again, things are getting tweaked a little more. Next. You notice, uh, I don't know if you can even read those, but Tin Man and Scarecrow and Lion, these are, none of these are in the place there are, they are on the play field currently. There's all these sorts of things changed. This one was much closer over here to the edge than it ended up being. And it's just, you know, that's lining up the shots and you, it's kind of odd. I was talking to somebody yesterday, it's kind of odd shooting at rollover targets, you know, it's like you want to hit something at the end of your shot and then trying to line up a shot and then worrying about where the ball might hit after you make your rollover shot and, you know, go outside or something like that. So it's a whole different dynamic. Things early on, like the, the Galinda target up here, was they were thinking that might be a ruby target. Kansas, you see this in the early shots a lot. Um, and actually it stayed in the game all the way uh, you'll see through these drawings quite quite a long time. They're thinking that this S layout and the, and the Kansas targets were going to be by that outlaying pop bumper, but it turned out the action didn't work out very well, and then, and then went to what we have now. Another drawing here. Um, you, you know, you got the haunted forest up in here, so you get uh, spooks maybe going up into the there. You spill out the different shots up into the pop bumpers. You get some wisecracking names on the out lanes like goodbye and things, you know, you know that's going to be the out lane later on, so, you know, you, you mark that for later. Again, here's something big here, it's going to be in the middle of the play field, and this up here might be sort of big, and that one's going to be like, oh my goodness, wow, that's a really big shot. And, you know, the, just place markers, you know, for later on. <laughs> Now we start seeing them adding some of the artwork on top of it, so now they're refining some of the, the aesthetic portions of it. You see some of the, you see this image, they used it again later, it's on that uh, standard edition apron now. So, you know, that, that's kind of cool. The lions and tigers and bears, hot dog insert just kind of went away altogether. But the artwork has to work hand in hand with the inserts, which work hand in hand with your rule set and your designer and his shots and things like that. Am I talking too much? working with different ways to set up the the, uh, the lettering next to Scarecrow. And you'll notice on our games now that the fonts on the Scarecrow, Lint, Tin Man, Toto, all that stuff, very plain. Uh, they don't like you in licensing, I guess, if you're using a trademark name to use these fancy fonts where someone might not be able to read what the word is, so they want it to be very plain. Again, another one of those subtleties. In this shot also, you notice the force of a different color start, uh, insert being added here, which is a major rule upgrade. You know, you're going to have shots all over the play field now that have these, these horse of a different color 
on them also so that you're, you can run a different mode with using the same sorts of shots. The, it's a twister here, ends up being up under the ramp in the later version, but here it's kind of the reverse. The lock is up under the ramp and the twister thing's down here. Looks like it's coming out of the, the scarecrow's ear. That's probably not going to work too well. Um, you need some cool shots up in this area. You know, cool one, cool two. That's a good, good place marker for that. For that, maybe extra ball on this uh, winky guard at some point. You know, add a horse of a different color. That just some of the things that are, that are working their way through. Next. Okay, here's another interesting. You know, a little twist on that, that same character from now inside the ball. And now you start to see the, the witch's hands in there. Hmm, that looks kind of cool. Something uh, that might stick a little later on. Did you see the good versus bad side of the play field early on? They were using different uh, plastic ideas just to, to get an idea of how that would look. Next. Oh, this is a uh, you know, Honda Forest again. Now we're working on different ways to, to do spooky. That was kind of clever using the two O's and spooky for the, the owl's eyes. The witch and her broomstick are a big um, part of the you know the, the movie, the theme. So we've got to do something with her broomstick in, fr in front of her there. We start out with kill the witch and of course the politically correct among us. We have in a kinder, gentler world. We're probably going to have to change that. You'll notice it did on the, on the final game. Toto over here, this didn't change a, a whole lot. Like I said, the font got a lot simpler. But, you know, the little dogs down there and then they put little doggy footprints walking around that way. Next. And then the, we went through, a, you can see in these drawings, a whole lot of iterations on, on these, uh, for these shot um, shoot here type inserts. The, you know, trying to do something different, something unique, but then, you know, have that on all the different fan-ish sort of shots around our play field. Um, some early artwork for the, the, the monkey, the flying monkey here. This ended up being more like what we used on the, the plastic that covers the magnet that comes down and picks up the ball. And then of course you see flying monkey, that the winged monkey is the correct trademark phrase, not flying monkey. And it's not just the lion, it's the cowardly lion. And so, you know, all these little subtleties. Um, again, up here, the same sort of witch stuff, but now, now a lot, it's starting to add a little more detail. Maybe we'll put some shadows around the, the pop bumpers here, um, some, some shadows for trees and things like that. This actually, this piece of artwork is, is from the movie and ended up actually being on a piece of plastic now that's, that's set up over here over the, the skill shop. Um, I guess to say that the, Just monkey, monkey. It ended up being winged monkey. Um, see, he's haunted here now instead of spooky. The the uh, area up here to the winky guard is getting a lot more defined now. You see some of those different. Let's try something different for these shoot here shots. You know, different ways to frame those out. The twister now has moved up under the ramp. The ramp flap is here, so you got your twister up where it's supposed to be. Lock is still kind of in flux here. Where we're going to put that next. Hurry up! We've ridden around the the uh, center of the the play field where they where they put the uh, hourglass, which it begins to get a little redundant. You know, an hourglass. You see that sand falling. That tells you hurry up already, right there. So they end up taking that out. No place like home. You got to have that somewhere on the play field, right? And they put it on some of the back glasses too. So you know, early on it was in the middle of there. That changed eventually too. Next. Next. Another. More, and this is getting very close to the final version now. Now we've got the witch, and she's reaching for the ruby slippers. That's, that's a really cool shot. Still have the old plastics, haven't changed the, the plastics there yet. The, now they're putting this uh, either a crystal ball or a pinball with their reflection in it. It's really hard to see in this, in this lighting, but um, you know, now the, the wizard, uh, the uh, yellow brick road starts to come out of the center there. It's a lot more defined. They start putting these concentric circles in here that later they start putting the, the you know, the, the Elvira gulch and on her bicycle and the, the house pieces and cows and things like that floating around in circle here. And then you see the, this is where they added the, the winged monkeys coming up the end lane, which is still on the play field too. Very cool. Now we're getting to the final artwork here for the the winged monkeys up there. Still says, now they say flying monkey here. That's got to change the winged monkey eventually. But you know, this whole area starts to get some notes in here about how we're going to have shading to, to like shadows of trees and branches and things going off into the 
to the fade to a sky up here at the top. That's the throne room, beginning of the, of the throne room there. They start, you know, the center of where the ball lands in there is where the wizard's head is and the green mist and all. There's a curtain here. There's going to be a plastic right on top of this area that has Toto pulling the thing back and, and revealing that the Wizard of Oz isn't so spectacular after all. The witch, you know, her broom is going to, like I said, is going to play a big part. That, that's the whole reason why they had to go kill the witch was to get the broom. So now we've got that kind of finalized. The haunted forest is very much, you know, more detailed and looking like it ended up in the final version. Now you notice it's Melt the Witch. We gotta be a little, like say, kinder, gentler, you know, and, and instead of going to, you know, use harsh language at the witch or something like that, we're just, we had to go to, you know, just the wicked witch and put it on there. So uh -huh. we're not hurting her, we're just melting her. She'll come back, you'll see. Um, <coughs> next, please. Now, this is a, a, a different, the same, same drawing as the previous, just other things I wanted to point out. The characters, again, are, are much more now in the position that they are. The, the, Lettering is still going to change, as you see on the. They have to add the cowardly over lion here, and add the trademarks underneath all of these because these are all trademark names. You've got the, you know, Glinda behind Dorothy added into this, and we've got a a, a, a mare now. Next. And there's no place like home for this area now. To each one of those targets. Um, you know, I've got five targets now instead of the six that we had in the S originally. And you get a lot better action there with that pop bumper where the, all those targets direct the ball back into the pop bumper. You know, things like goodbye and, and the hurry ups have been getting a little more definition showing that this is going to be a throne and the, you know, the orbit and hurry and, and all the other, the rainbow and things like that that, that are coming down that side. And then what, what better way to say goodbye in the Wizard of Oz than click heels. So, you know, that, it just all came together there. Again, the lock um, insert here because you know, a lot of artwork over it. Put it right in front of the ramp like it is now. The twister's moving up where it was supposed to be. And uh, of course, everybody knows about the flower field. Here's a let's look at the, the possibility of putting flowers behind the flipper on the upper play field, and that didn't, yeah, not so much. So we moved on from that. Next, and then here's the the final piece. This is what we ended up with. Um, again, like I said, the, the, the Wizard of Oz up here. You've got all your hurry ups and things that they were showing earlier. The horse of a different color. And, and what's, you know, what strikes you looking at this is that every insert in here is clear. You know, so we have RGB LEDs under every single area. Even the GIs are capable of the 32 million different colors. So, you know, a lot of, lot of programming for teeth to do on that front to get all the light shows working. So, you know, a lot of a lot of things can a lot of possibilities. I mean, just imagine give, being given this palette and somebody saying, you know, do your thing, Keith. You know, it, it's a massive undertaking. And I, I think when you see the game, I've heard this at several shows in the past, that when you see the, the game in person that you really start to get it and you understand a little more why it's taking so long, a little more why you know there's been delays and things like that. And uh, you know, our customers God bless them, you know, been coming up to us and saying, you know, take as long as you need, and, and we're definitely doing that. But, you know, we're, we're, we're doing our best to get it out as quickly as possible, but we're also, you know, working really hard and changing things, making cor making corrections, even this late in the game, fixing little things that we see, and just swallowing it, you know, throwing away these old, uh, this screw or this part that didn't work and getting new stuff in, so it just, it's, a, it's an exercise in Murphy's Law, basically, you know, you, it always takes longer than you think it will. When you make that as your first product, when you when you put that game out, while you're starting up a company, while you're bringing in new employees, all this kind of thing, it's just a massive undertaking. And we appreciate your patience. Okay, some other uh, cool things you see only at the factories. And uh, so, <laughs> Disco Jack <laughs> is dancing fool up on top of the parts cab that's got to get him down from there every so often. And there's the close. He's a happy dancer, not just your, your normal. Yeah, that, that's a lot of fun. And then on the, the refrigerator, we have uh, his honor, Mayor Steve. He's Steve Zamonski out there. Didn't know he was a former Munchkin Land. He, was, he looks a lot taller in real life. This is uh, Hank over Jack's office door. Nobody gets in to see the wizard. Not nobody, not no how. Uh, and he has the most massive collection of Wizard of Oz stuff that you've ever seen, just piled up in corners all around his desk. It's, it's a 
amazing. He says everybody he meets wants to give him something. And they give him, and he puts it in there, he displays it with everything else. It's really cool. And then some inspiration for our next game hanging on the wall right outside his office. And now, I put that on there originally thinking, you know, kind of change the order on, on us here. If you don't mind me taking another five or ten minutes, I'll show you a little bit about the manual. I'm writing the manual for the, the Wizard of Oz. Then we'll take some questions after that. Um, I came in, you know, last year at this show, Jack introduced me as a guy that's going to be running around the country and, and uh, teaching people how to use the, you know, maintain, repair, play the game. So, you know, I was technical support and that sort of thing was going to be my, my forte. Um, that's kind of evolved a little bit now. I'm going to actually get to do some of the help with the design on the next game. I'm really excited about that and being in on the ground floor with that. But one of the first things, you know, we were talking on the phone, Jack and I, and he, and he asked, uh, you know, how, how things are going, and I wanted to get involved, and he's like, well, we're just not there yet, we're not ready for you to come on, and I asked him about the manual, and he said, you can write, and I said, yeah, I'm kind of an oddity in electrical engineers like that, I actually can write. <laughs> electrical engineers are, are, you know, if it's difficult to figure out, it'll be difficult to convey on, on paper, I guess, these kind of programming sort of things. So I'm going to show you some of the, you know, the, the scope here of, of what you're doing when you take on the manual for the Wizard of Oz. You've seen that game there. Imagine, you know, being now the same thing as, sort of thing as Keith when they, they bring you in and they just say, well, here's the game, you know, document it. We, everything in here is going to have a part number. You need to have a drawing of it and show where pieces are. They can order parts. They can put, take some apart, put it back together again without having to, you know, photograph the whole experience. Well, this is the... Wizard of Oz playfield with everything on it, looking from the top as if it were transparent. You see all these stuff underneath. You see the, all the stuff on the top. A lot of it's very simplified, like these uh, um, flipper mechanisms and, and things. But you got everything from your routing to your holes to your spotting for mounting things to to uh, you know uh, T nuts. Everything is in this this. Everything from you know the size of T-nuts and plastics and yellow, the yellow outlines of plastic, and you got pop bumpers and you got pop bumper bodies and holes inside the pop bumper. Yeah, it's that's amazing the detail here. We this goes all the way down to the little resistors and all on the RGB LED board. So you know you look at that and you say, well, okay, now I want to do a drawing, to put in the manual to show you know the rubbers and where the locations are, what sizes they are. Well, how can you do that? Well, I've got, um, first thing when I started the manual, I'm, I knew we were going to have a white body game. We're going to have a big monitor in the back box. Monitors are never square anymore. They're always oblong. So the first thing that came to mind was me, if, if we're going we're gonna to have a white body game, a white body monitor up there, why don't we have a white body manual? So what I did was take, I told Jack, I, I don't want to put this on 8.5 by 11, I'm going to use legal size, 8.5 by 14. I'm not going to stand it up this way, I'm going to lay it on its side. And I'm going to put it in some kind of a binding to where you don't have to lay, you know, your screwdriver and your crescent wrench and everything else to keep it open while you're trying to work on the game. I want it to fold open. And now when I fold two pages, pages of legal open facing one another, I've got a heck of a canvas there for putting drawings and then information to where you can see them all at the same time. And I do have a hard copy that I unfortunately did bring with me from my room, but I'll, I'll have it out there around the, you know, if you want to talk afterwards, I can show it to you, a hard copy of it. But, um, so, you know, you can do a lot, of, a lot of cool things and have a lot of information and have it big enough where a person could read while he's doing something working here on the game. We're having to pick it up and, and look or get it under one of those magnifiers and things like that. So, Try to, try to make something that's a little easier to read and something that's unusual, something that hasn't been done before in the past. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I, like I said, I've done a lot of board work. I've seen manuals from every manufacturer, from the old Bally's and the, and the old, uh, you know, Godly manuals, and, you know, what they called manuals back in the electromechanical days, all the way up through Data East, Sega, um, the Stern manuals, the, uh, you know, Williams, Bally, everything all the way up through the 90s. And, and I see things that I really like in this manual. I see things I really like in that one. Boy, I can't stand that in that manual. You know, and, and now I get to choose, you know? So it's, it's really cool to, 
to, to do that, it's also, you know, quite a responsibility, too. And I take it very seriously. I want something that, that'll work really well for us, work really well for you. So now if you, if you move left and right here, this is the main play field, and it's got a view from the top that shows the routing and all the pieces that are mounted on the top here, you know, down to the ramps and things like that, drop targets. And then you've got the other side, you've got from the bottom side, you see what the, the, the up kickers and, and rollover switches and all that sort of thing, RGB LED boards, flipper mechanisms, slingshots, all that sort of thing look like. So if I'm going to do one for doing, the, you know, documenting rubbers for the game, then I probably start with the top. So I, I then change, take this file and I copy a piece and part out of it. This is what's given to me by the Joe Balsers of the world. It says, here, here's your play field, but, you know, good luck with that. And so <laughs> I take and I delete everything out of that that I'm not going to be documenting right now. I know I'm not going to do much on, you know, T-nuts and things like that. So I, I take a lot of the routing and the holes and things that aren't going to show out, and I simplify it to this version in uh, AutoCAD. Now, in a, a drawing is made in AutoCAD, if it's done correctly, then you can um, actually come back in. This one's got the ramp moved off to the side. But you can actually go in in different layers here, and I can turn parts on and off that I don't want to see, or uh, so I can go down in this list here. And, you know, and Joe does a great job of separating things out. If I don't want to see the flat rails anymore, I can just turn those off. If I don't want to see, you know, flipper bats, I can get where you can see the flipper bats here. Um, can turn those off. You still see the the rubber? That's the green going around in there where they were before. Um, something a little more. Take all the, the plastics off, for instance. And then all the plastics disappear. So I can turn all those on and off, and then I can, you know, get into these, these individual pieces and, and work with them and select things without selecting, you know, other areas that I, I didn't intend to. Um, but layers thing is very powerful, is what I guess I'm trying to say, in my usual more than worse than necessary. When I take that now and I, I, I send it off and I save it in a DXF type format that I can then call into Adobe Illustrator. And in Adobe Illustrator then I can take, I have the same sort of thing in Adobe. When I save it in DXF format, it actually saves things, the layers also, so that when I get it over into here, if I want to turn these on and off, I can turn the rubbers on and off just by doing that. And you see, oh, the flipper rubber didn't go away. Well, the flipper rubber is a different, a different layer on here. So it's rubber one here, and these are going to flip orders go away. So very powerful, you know, in, in terms of selecting and building things. But I, I also have to go in and, 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 you know, make these into solid objects and make them, you know, color them and things so that I can then, uh, you know, do something that, that, that shows them in, in greater detail. <laughs> In fact, I can even take and rearrange the layers now that there's, it preserved those layers. I mean, you see the plastics are still here, but I can now take the rubbers and put them on top of the plastics just to call them out better. And then I add the little circles with the numbers and all. And then I have an Excel spreadsheet here where I go in and I've got all the, the part numbers and everything that I've gotten from the bill of materials. And I've got the descriptions for these. And, uh, you know, Jim Thornton allowed me to change the names of some of the things. That, you know, when you're putting a million parts together. You don't have, always have the time to sit down and think of, you know, what's a, when somebody says, well, gee, I need one of these flipper rubber rings or something, it's kind of a simple example. But, you know, some of the names that he was coming up with things, that I, I was thinking, you know, if someone got on the phone and said, you know, I'm, I'm missing this, and they grab off this 40, 42 character, you know, parts description, the person on the phone, eh, give me a part number. You know, I want to be able to, to make things a little more transparent to, to people out in the field, you know, make, the, make a little more sense, or I, I don't have to have the part number exactly for you to know what I'm talking about. So, you know, I worked on that as I went along, too, part of the, the slowdown. And then you got how many are in each. So then I take all, all of this, and I've got one here for flat rails, and i got ball guide rails, and switches, and, you know, mini play field switches, and dedication. I, all these are going to correspond to a page in the manual that, that, uh, that I then take over into InDesign. And now I've got the, uh, the play field drawing here. I flip, turn it on the side now, because I've got a white body page. And then the next page here has drawings of the smaller play field. And so these will be facing pages in the manual. And you'll have the, the, uh, 
the rubber rings information here that just copies and pastes across this tab to limited text and drop it right in. I don't want to get too technical with this, but um, that's just you know one small area. Then I go back to that main drawing again and I start deleting things and taking stuff off and moving things to the top to show flat rails, to show you know plastic posts, metal spacers. Look on that game for metal spacers. You'll see a hundred bazillion of them on there. It's a lot of things to document. So, in those, in those words, I'm, I'm telling you why it's taking me so long to get the manual out. So, just <laughs> so you can kind of commiserate with me a little bit there. Now, we can uh, get, yeah, get the Skype master over here. Technologically challenged out of the way. Wow, back at camera a little bit. Welcome to Texas, Jack. Everything's bigger in Texas, so I guess my picture's bigger on the screen, huh? <laughs> yeah. Is anybody still awake after Butch got finished explaining about the... <laughs> uh, I get you for that. You know, um, I asked... I was, I was happy that uh, Butch and Eric are there, and I think it's more important that the game is there than me, but first of all, hello everybody. How's everybody this morning? Thank you. Yeah. Um, the show looks, I was already reading Martin's report um, this morning about the show, and it looks, uh, it looks big. Everything's bigger in Texas, so congratulations to, um, to the guys. Uh, you know, uh, Paul and Ed and Kim, I know so many people work really hard on the show. And um, I just got back from Italy. I just flew in and my arms were quiet. So uh, I didn't make it out to Texas, I'm sorry. But um, where's Johnny Norman? Is he there? <laughs> yeah. Where is he? I love your Jack. If, if I can hug you, just this is a hug for you. All right? <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, you can't, uh, that I'm not there. But uh, I'll get out there. I'll get out there. Do I sound okay? Am I yeah, 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 right. You sound normal. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just, I just wanted to tell everybody that uh, I kind of, uh, you know, it's not that I picked Texas not to go to. Um, uh, you know, I'm not going to Vegas next week to the Amway show, and I'm not going to Midwest Gaming Classic. And I see Martin there right in the front, typing away, hey Martin, and where's, where's Jim? Where's my buddy Shelberg? Where is he? I spent the whole day with him yesterday and may have already kind of worn him out. I don't know. He knows he's going to get a copy of my presentation too. Well, you can't wear him out. It's impossible to wear him out, you know. So uh, the more the more he uh, the more he asks for information, if you push him away, the more he asks for. So just give him whatever he wants and make him happy, you know. Um, you know, the show in Italy was really amazing for me. It was my first time at the Anata show. And to see the response of operators, especially to the game, they were very energized. And um, I came away from there with a little different um, understanding of what's going on in the world. Uh, they, they have some great Italian uh, collectors, and uh, they had the IFPA Italy had a tournament on Wizard of Oz that was a lot of fun. And we got coverage. Um, Good thing the Pope was chosen later in the day because we had to, we had to get coverage uh, battle with uh, the white smoke and the black smoke uh, of the Pope uh, to get coverage. But um, they did cover uh, pinball at the show, and a lot of operators are very uh, very excited about operating Wizard of Oz. Also, what I what I didn't realize is that in other countries, um, Wizard of Oz is not that well known. So with the release of the new movie this week, uh, a lot more people around the world are going to first discover Wizard of Oz and understand what flying monkeys were and uh, uh, some of the other elements of the game. So I think going along this next year, and as we get games out um, to all of you that ordered it on location and around the world, um, it's only going to get better even as we get into the 75th anniversary of the movie. Um, later at the end of this year when that whole celebration starts. Um, 
you know, um, we're gonna ship we're gonna ship real games this month. Um, uh, less than two weeks from today, we'll be shipping real games. And um, I just want to tell everybody the games, uh, you know, planning that they are feature complete, and uh, of course ongoing uh, software. Uh, uh, continuing uh, support, you know, it's not that we're going to pull Keith and and um, Ted and Alex and Kip or anybody working on software, we're going to pull them off the game and they're going to they're work on Hobbit because Hobbit at this point obviously is in development. I'll talk about that in a little bit, um, in a couple minutes, but we didn't come all this way to develop this game and spend a couple million dollars, two years to develop the game and then put it out there and it's not uh, what we would all expect it to be. So um, we're going to stay on that road to make sure uh, uh, that it's it's as great as we could possibly make it and, and beyond. Because uh, what we've done with a lot of the game is go, um, you know, too much actually with some of it. Uh, but I, I really wouldn't have changed a lot of things about the game as it is. I'm very happy with it. Uh, games that are on location now, collections are, you know, better and better every single week uh, at locations that have them. You know, there's been sort of updates uh, every week, every two weeks, uh, in location. So, I'm happy with how that's working. What's up? Did the roof go up there? <laughs> Pretty much, you know, I'm, I'm happy where we are. I'm, you know, always the eternal optimist. It uh, would have been better if uh, we shipped games three or four months ago, but we couldn't do it. Um, so, um, you know, it's, it's, it's coming together. Anybody have any questions? Let me stop for a minute. Anybody got any questions for me about anything? Yeah, we got one. What's the biggest thing yeah. you learned through this process? What's the biggest thing you've learned through this process? The biggest thing I've learned through this process is that everything is going to take more time and more money than anybody tells you uh, it's going to it's going to take. And um, you know, it's no, it's no excuse, um, but it's not it's not easy to make something uh, from an original idea uh, today in this country. Um, we have some games that are made in China. Uh, for our other company and their, their video redemption and there'll be uh, one of them actually on display at IAPA, at IAPA, at AMOA next week. And, you know, it took us, when you see the game and the introduction, it's a beautiful game, it makes money on location. You know, it took us two months to make the game. So, uh, you know, making a video game, making uh, other things, it's a lot less complicated. Uh, doing this, um, I don't think I would have said no to anybody again. I, I think, um, you know, we did learn. This is going to be probably the worst game we ever make. Uh, I said that to some people in Italy and, and they got a good laugh because they understood what I was saying. I was very lucky to meet uh, Marino Zaccaria who is basically the Harry Williams of Italy. Uh, you know, they were the third biggest pinball manufacturer in the world uh, years ago. And uh, a lot of people came to love a lot of their games. And I had a great conversation with him and the people at Technoplay. And to have Technoplay as my distributor is another really good thing for us in Italy. But uh, yeah, everything takes more time and more money. That's what I learned. And that was a lady? Yep, yep. Yeah. Well, that's that's the smartest sex for sure. <laughs> um, Thanks, you can't Jack. make I said it I said it last year in Texas and I, I say it a lot of different places I go. Um, it, it, you know, why would I want to make a game that eliminates uh, children and women? So what we're finding on location and people like Parker at Marvin's Mechanical Museum or Kaz or Alan Pinaholic in Manhattan at the bar, or Buddy in the movie theater, all the places that we're finding our games, you know, young people playing the game that never play pinball, um, and, and, and women, girls. You know, you put that game in a bar, 
and every every girl in the bar is playing that game, and every guy is next to every girl trying to play the game with her. So I really enjoy that. That's something that I hoped uh, a couple of years ago would happen, and I and I see it happening on location. So that's very cool. You open it. Who's? <laughs> What is your ramp up for production going to look like, and and how long do you think it'll take to get out the first 250, 500, and so on? Great. So um, our assembly line, we had a, an efficiency expert from our industry come in and tell us what we could build on our assembly line a day under the under you know if the sun was shining and the moon was out and everything like that and you know it's about it's about 60 games a day um i don't i don't envision us getting to 60 games a day maybe ever uh but you know the plan is to get to between 10 and 15 games a day uh by the middle of by the middle of april and i uh, pretty pretty much think that's realistic being that um all the parts are here. We continue to hire more and more people every day. Um, you know, somebody told me that I created more jobs in the last two years than the president and the U.S. government created in the last four years. <laughs> so you know, uh, it's it's really cool. We had uh, we have an online ad for assembly people for the assembly line, and we got 145 applicants. And um, that we've been going through, bringing people in. I talked to Ken, who runs production in the back. Another four people are starting on Monday. So you know, it's it's a gradual thing where we've taught people, we've brought people in. Um, they've learned, uh, run through, run through everything. Um, so you know, when I when I look at it now, um, some days feel like uh, two years. Some days feel like two hundred years. Some days feel like two weeks since we're doing this, but um, I think we're in really good production numbers as we get through April into May. A lot of people are gonna get games. There's, there's a lot of stuff in this building. There's four and a half million dollars worth of parts here. Just the parts department alone in the back is 12,000 square feet of the building, all racked, all organized because uh, of the people. Uh, it's amazing when I go back there and see what's going on that, um, it's it's crazy to me sometimes, especially when customers come visit and we show them through what's going on. It's like, how did how did this all happen? You know, it's just, but it's amazing. We we got a pinball manufacturing company. It's just crazy what we do. You know, um, I was online with the video. And I was I was watching how to do it. You know, if I I, I really wanted to do the Skype in the factory because I wanted to show more stuff. But in the back, I don't know the wireless or the G3 or G4 or whatever it was didn't work clearly. I was I, I was gonna, but there will be a video of me doing a cartwheel as uh, as real game ship uh, later this month. You know, I didn't think. First of all, I was in Italy when they shipped out a couple of games the other day and they were boxed up. So, you know, I have a couple of glasses of wine. It's easy to do a cartwheel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I might just do a handstand. You know, <laughs> walk around on my hands. There were, obviously there was a lot of lessons learned with the uh, with the first game, but with Hobbit, are you going to keep pushing that technology? I like what you've done with RGB, with the monitor, or are you going to level off? Or are you going to try to keep climbing? Technology push is phenomenal compared to the, not knocking anybody else to what you've done. You know, I, yep, I get that. I, I kind of, um, I kind of answered that almost in advance before by saying that The Wizard of Oz is our worst game that we're going to do. So um, you can't expect to see things evolve. I think five years from now, when I look back at The Wizard of Oz and we're into game number four or five by then, um, I could always look back at it uh, being proud of it and proud of what the team did as a first game. But I do see uh, technology as it's changed, even in the design. And I mean, Butch and Eric, if you get them and you get a couple of beers into them, you know, they would probably tell you about a lot of the changes that we made 
to this game, you know, just in the last six months or seven months or eight months, you know, because we could have said this is it and we're done and it's good enough and it's going to work, but uh, we changed things. You know, uh, you saw at IAPA there was a tornado driver board that was on the play field. The tornado driver board is gone and that board is incorporated into the I.O. board. Uh, there are other, other subtle changes that you might not see on the top of the game, but we're under the game. Uh, because remember, you know, as a technician and as an operator, I have a unique personal experience that a lot of other people may not have. Pinball designers were never pinball people that repaired pinball machines on a route. Pinball designers were never people that were operators that revenue shared hundreds of games on location. So my sensitivity was always that the game uh, first and foremost work and that the game is fun. So if those two elements are there, uh, the game is going to be a really cool game to have in your home. It's going to be a really cool game to operate, uh, you know, and make money with. Uh, so those those were the dynamics. But I could see um, maybe less wiring in the game at some point going forward. Uh, as I said in the past, we didn't want to be too radical and uh, make a lot of little circuit boards and things like that that can't be repaired by an operator. Uh, we want to try to have things that are uh, user-friendly, Operator friendly. Um, that's why a warranty on our game is a year uh, on a lot of components have a year warranty. Um, and you know what? It wouldn't surprise me if somebody has something out of warranty and they call up and I say, yeah, just send them that thing. Who cares? I don't really care. Uh, you know, it's it's more about supporting the product out there, making sure you have fun with it in your home that the people coming over to play it have a great time, that the games on location work and we support them. That's more important to me really than the money coming over the place. Doing the Hobbit, what would be our next license choice? If we didn't get the Wizard of Oz? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. You know, there's a real there's a real funny coincidence about today's date and the Wizard of Oz because two years ago today, the license belonged to Eloud USA. And at the time I was partners with Eloud. And um, you know, my partner at the time didn't want to do a pinball machine. He, you know, he wasn't part of Jersey Jack Pinball at Eloud. Um, I, they asked to have 10% of my new company, which I said, okay, fine, without any investment. And then um, they kind of got spooked about pinball. Some people went and talked to them and scared the crap out of them. And all of a sudden, two years ago today, the license belonged to Eloud. And Jersey Jack did not have the license for the Wizard of Oz. Okay? And this rolled out on the 15th of March, which happens to be the Ides of March. So be careful when friends of yours are stabbing you in the back and kill you on the 15th. That was the day it happened. Can't make it up. The 16th and then the 17th, St. Patrick's Day, I solved the problem. And it was the 19th St. Joseph's Day, which I actually signed the agreement with, with Warner Brothers. So to go back to the story, you know, at Eloud, I licensed The Wizard of Oz because I wanted to have this, this big anchor uh, theme on a redemption game that we were working on. And that game, to still today, is the greatest redemption game built as The Wizard of Oz pusher that Eloud has. Now they have them as a six player, a three player, a two player. In Europe, I saw it, now they have a ticket dispenser on it. So God bless them, they're doing really well with the game, I'm happy about that. With our license for The Wizard of Oz, uh, I wound up uh, going back and renegotiating it and getting it. If I didn't get The Wizard of Oz, you know, we were thinking, the first license we were thinking of was Three Stooges. Uh, <laughs> You know, the Three Stooges was always my favorite um, because, you know, all the slapstick stuff. And what happened, the people that owned the Three Stooges 
they kind of gave us a hard time about a license fee, what it would be, and it kind of frustrated us in the beginning. And then I asked Drew to find out what Warner Brothers had, and that whole list of things came in the story about, well, get me the Wizard of Oz, and he said, really? You want the Wizard of Oz? You know, so, um, if it wasn't the Wizard of Oz, so the question, right? If it wasn't the Wizard of Oz, it would have had to be something that was um, uh, friendly, family friendly, um, and gender friendly, and fun. So I don't know what it would have been, but I'm gonna tell you my original thought of what it was is what I'm working on for license, for another license and another license and another license. I'm working on three different licenses right now. One of them's a music license, uh, one of them's a movie license, and one of them is um, a different kind of license. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, on the uh, the games that you'll be shipping within the next couple months or so, is the code that's out there on the games right now the same code that's going to be on those games, or are they going to have more uh, complete code? They're definitely going to have more complete code. But I'll let you answer. Yeah, the code is on the game right now. But... No, no, no. What, what happens with code is that we never, we never release the latest code. Um, you know, Keith, between Keith and Ted, you know, um, they have the latest code. You know, if Keith is home coding right now on his game, obviously his game is a lot further advanced than your game is. So, um, you know, it, it'll probably be in the 60s or something like that by the time uh, we, ship, we ship games. And really, you know, um, um, uh, you know, it's, it, to me, it's got to be a game. And I'll tell you one thing that was uh, a, a good thing that I thought in Italy. With all the Italian players there, and then uh, some of them knowing what the Wizard of Oz were, and some of them not knowing it, uh, they beat the crap out of those games for about eight, nine hours straight. Um, and, and none of them said to me, a lot of the things that I thought they might have said to me. Uh, they did ask me questions about, you know, modes and what would happen and, and this and that, but uh, they had a blast on the games as they were. And, and it, you know, um, I know I said it before, I wrote it on our, on our group, but if, if we were way back in the day, let's say it's 1992, when we built this game and it worked and you put it on location and it made money, I guess you could call it a day. You know that the game was good enough to be a game, but certainly we know today, by standards of what we do with this game, all the amazing light shows, all the animation, all the sound, all of that stuff. Um, wait, wait till this game is done. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. If you like it now, you're just going to like it a lot more. How about the moment testing? A lot of us have seen like the, the Valley Factory where they had the uh, test fixtures and things. What kind of testing have you done in the components? So, uh, You know, Eric, you're probably better to answer that than me because you've built all the fixtures and beat everything to crap. <laughs> so I built all the test pictures that we use at Jersey Jack. Um, the first project I had was testing our play fields, seeing the different coatings that we had, the test picture that would continually run pinballs over them. Um, it's still running in my office. It's loud as hell. Uh, it's got a million and a half rolls on the play fields. So using those, we were able to determine which kind of code we wanted to go with um, for the best results for wear and drop and drag on a ball. After that, I built test pictures for the monkey mech, for the witch, for the castle doors, banging on each of them 100,000 times to see what would break. We redesigned some stuff, put some different bushings on some things, put some couplers on some things. And from those, we have our factory parts. At the factory, I built a test picture for every component we have in the game. Every single component is individually tested before it's put in the game to verify that it works. 
the monkey might have been brought up and down 10 or 15 times, the witch is brought up and down 10 or 15 times. And when the game is fully assembled, there's a burning where all the cards work together. All right, next question. Um, uh, this is Jared from Little Rock. Um, uh, can you tell us um, what we think is the topper? The, is this the final topper that's going to be shipped on a special edition? So Jared from Little Rock, I think you remember him from uh, Expo last year. He had some um, crystal balls. He asked me if this is the topper that we going to be you know, I can't lie to a kid, especially. <laughs> I think we, we all lie to some extent, but sometimes we uh, we embellish things or whatever. So, now, Jared, you remember what I told you about the crystal ball, right? What did I tell you? It was a light show? Yes. Yep. Right. So... <clears throat> So there's the topper, and, and you know, you people ask all kinds of questions. You must figure right over here. I got something that I can pull out. So you know, uh, I am the wizard of pinball. Um, you know, apparently, some people have said that. Some people called me the Pope of Pinball, which I felt bad when they, you know, it was really cool being in Italy when they chose a new Pope. Uh, that was pretty cool. Um, so, Jared, there's, there's the topper. That's the topper for the Emerald City Limited Edition. The topper that you've seen on all the games, the green one, is the topper for the Wizard of Oz, the regular games that we're doing, okay? Thank you. Let's go there first, right? So when we operate our games on location, we're competing against everything in an FEC. We're competing against the crane that picks up uh, something that you're never going to win almost. Uh, you're competing with redemption games that give tickets. You're competing with other things there um, for amusement and entertainment. So um, that's why we built the game the way we built it and put all the things into it that we put into it. Um, I will say that the game as it is now, what it is going to become, okay? The Wizard of Oz is the Wizard of Oz. And let me try to put this the right way. What the game is right now is complete. But what the game is going to do in another few months is what we're going to introduce next, in the next phase of what the game does. Because that game right now is only a vehicle for proof of concept of other things that we're gonna make uh, Jersey Jack Pinball Machine do. How it's gonna be able to interact in an amusement center, how it's going to be played, um, and how players are gonna interact with each other through the game. So um, I think competitors, uh, there's probably about six or seven or eight different companies now maybe 10 companies building pinball machines uh, in different stages, whether they're, you know, um, you know building uh, 10 games or 20 or 30 games at a time or 100 games or whatever they're doing. I, I think in the last two years, a lot of people have told me that we have created a lot of excitement in pinball, that we've brought a lot of people uh, forward, where we've empowered a lot of people to believe uh, that they're able to do things. Um, we've also, um, uh, again, you know, people that worked for our company that were not able to get jobs in the industry, 
Uh, they were able to get jobs at other companies, uh, working places, so I'm really happy about that. Um, I think competition is, is the greatest thing on earth because uh, it would be very boring if you had only the Texas Rangers and they weren't playing the Yankees, okay? It would be, once in a while we like to win though, you know, we don't want to get our ass kicked all the time, but you know, it would be very boring. It would be very boring if um, there was only one of anything because the last, the last of anything on the planet is big loser. So you don't want to be a loser. You don't want to be the last doing anything. You really wonder why you're still doing something if you're the last. So having two, three, four, five different companies competing with each other, it gives you the opportunity as a player to go play different pinball machines. It gives the operator an opportunity to buy different pinball machines and operate them and have them in a location competitively making money. And I think it's a lot healthier. So things that we do, um, we're going to keep doing them. Uh, we're going to keep spending money. We're going to keep innovating. We're going to keep uh, creating. And, um, you know, that's, that's how the company has to be. It has to always think ahead. And again, you know, I said it many times before, it was like my iPad um, analogy a couple of years ago. You know, I really didn't know I, I wanted an iPad until I, I, I saw the thing. So we want to try to get you uh, what you don't even know you want yet. That's what we want to try to create. Any other questions? All right, yeah. So I just I just talked to you about the Hobbit for a second or two, right? So um, on the Hobbit, you know, we've been working on incorporating a lot of the ideas that are up on the Jersey Jack or Loop, and uh, we have a team meeting in the middle of April to figure out exactly what's going on in the game. Uh, we're going to be reading the script and seeing some movie assets in the next month or so. And, um, you know, I'm still on a timeline of uh, delivering that game, having that game ready in the summer of uh, 2014. And while the third movie is not scheduled to come out now until winter, you know, uh, Christmas of 14, um, you know, we could always add other assets into the video portion of the game uh, that JP does and stuff like that. Uh, there's going to be an announcement uh, probably next week about who's doing the music for the game uh, because that's an amazing development that we have on that game is, uh, is who's going to be doing the, uh, the original music for it for us. And um, it's going along a lot faster than Wizard of Oz, I can say that. Uh, it's true, I'll get the t-shirt. The second game, it's easier than the first game. So um, I'm real happy about that too. All right. Anybody else? You think? All right. Good. Hey, if this works, I never have to go to a show again. <laughs> no, I want to be in the show. I, I, I love being there. I do miss it. I probably could have done it. You know, my flight last night to come to Texas was at 7:30. And I got in from Italy like about 3 o'clock by the time I cleared customs. So I could have thrown my bag in the car of all the dirty clothes, got a new bag with all clean clothes, and then went back in the terminal and got on the plane and then came out there. So I, I probably could have done it. Maybe I'll have to do that next time. <laughs> I know. Well, you know what? The first year I did Texas and uh, Midwest Gaming Classic in the same day. I took four flights in one day, so I'm not I'm not that lazy. I just figured you guys could handle it without me. That's all. I have a lot of confidence in you guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. One last little thing I want to mention before we break up here. Uh, down in front here, you want to stand up, Kip? This is Ryan Kip Vorderman. We all have nicknames in this company, it seems like. He's signed on to, to work with software, too, so he's working on the updater and things for the game. So I'm going to ask him some questions about software, about what he's seen of Keith's code, you know, corner him somewhere. And the question over here? There's lots of speculation about how we'll update the software. Is there Wi-Fi built into the game? It's got a, you know, commercial off-the-shelf CPU board that you can hook anything you can hook into a normal computer to. 
So if we have Wi-Fi as a possibility in the future, currently no, but you know that's something we'll look at down the road. And I imagine if that comes out with the Hobbit, then you would have a kit to upgrade your Wizard of Oz to the same capability. That's that's kind of what we're looking at. That is right now. Kip, yeah, Kip can answer that. So, uh, that's one of the things we're working on right now. That's a much more center. Now you can plug in an Ethernet kit to it, and it'll, uh, it should be able to pull down an update from the server on the internet. So, you all expect that to happen? So yes. Yeah, that's, one the, that's one of the things I'm trying to work out with you right now. So. Okay, we're, we're going to have updates and, and uh, tech support online. A lot, of, uh, a lot of capability there to be developed and put into place over the next few months. So. Hey, Floyd, you got any Easter egg? <laughs> hey, if it's not broken, ain't pinball. If there's ain't pinball, there's got to be some Easter eggs in there, right? I mean, <laughs> if, I, if I tell you, well, yeah, they said my name was going to be in there way back when from the from putting the you know slogan on the arch and all that. But I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> That's the fun part about Easter eggs. What I told you about it wouldn't be any fun, but it wouldn't be near as cool when you finally came up. Sorry. For future shows, I mean, this is my opinion, but it'd be nice. To, I, I know tournaments are a big part of shows, but it'd be nice to have more shows on the floor. Yes. And that, that that's just. I know. agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a logistics issue at this point. You know, the 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 end of the assembly line, you know, they're putting together the, the few games that we're sending out to these shows before we wind up for real production. And there's just not a heck of a lot of games available right now. It's getting more out to distributors so that people can play them in showrooms and things like that. The public play it should be more important. Absolutely. But you know, I was, I was sitting in the audience where you guys are last year, and I heard Jack say to the guys, I can't wait till next year when we have games to put out there for your tournament and all that. And yeah, they wanted four games, five games, whatever. We took eight games to IAPA last uh, November, and we had eight games set up there. Boy, you talk about running around from one to the other, to trap ball, of this or that. Uh, you know, is that uh, it's just it's a, it's a nightmare to keep up with the things when you're at that point in your development of a game. But yeah, as we get, you know, the games are rung out better, and, and everything's working a lot better. And with the they're coming off the end of the line, 15 a day, that would be a lot a lot more likely to happen. We'll have more games at the shows, and, and more out there where people can. I, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with you. How many EL uh, e games are they making, and how many of the regular games are they making for that? They're making a thousand of the standard, or sorry, of the limited edition. Right, but I mean, how many they going to do each day of the machine? Oh, that I don't know. That's a good one. That's a mixture of parts and things, you know, the rails, the, the, the wire ramps, the lockdown bars, things like that. Um, while most of that is cabinet parts, the differences between the uh, so you know the play fields will be pretty much the same. The wire ramps are a little different, but, and the aprons are a little different. But you know where they start mixing in. I, I know the the limited editions have paid for theirs, and they're paid in full, and have been that way for quite some time. I would imagine that the big thrust is going to be to those limited edition games out first, and then start filling the standards. But that's not to say we'll build a few standards here and there too, and start feeding them like a because those do go to the, to the operators and get them out to where people can play them in the movie theaters and the, and, you know, the entertainment centers and such too, so it be a big deal too. Sir? So when, uh, when are we going to have uh, a uh, game on location here in uh, Dallas? Uh, Fun, Fun Billiards, the local distributor here, is taking the game from the floor on Sunday and bringing it back to their showroom. Mesquite, Texas, yeah, down in Mesquite, I believe. Yeah. So there'll be one there available to play. On location, you know, that, that's, it's in a distributor showroom. So, so you won't have to pay to play it, probably. <laughs> that's probably a better thing yet. But, you know, make an appointment, call the guy up, and Steve Nortzis, and uh, see when you can get by to play it. And then when will we have them on location here? That, that's a matter of, you know, who's bought some of these in this area and, and, and plan on putting them on a route. Some people are going to route limited edition games when they get them, so it's hard to say um, when, when, how many will be where at this point, so. Do you know what your overall production run is going to be, or is it just supply and demand? Jack says he wants to build a Wizard of Oz as long as people keep buying them. He'd like to sell one to everybody, so yeah, they're going to keep going as long as there's demand.
Is it going to be like the Surrey thing where they rerun stuff? All the comes out and starts small. I wouldn't count that out, no. You know, I, I would think that would be a very distinct possibility. Yeah. I've talked about using a little, we have a huge factory up there. We're not using the whole floor. And, you know, the present, a lot of it's just storing parts for, and pieces and big cabinets and all that. So, you know, they, they've talked about things like setting up one corner to do a, a, a smaller, you know, simpler game or something like that, maybe redoing the shuffle alley. Jack's talked about that a few times. You know, there's there's a lot of things that could go on in that factory. A lot of things could happen in parallel that wouldn't even affect each other. All right, guys. So, which one I'll be out on the floor all day. Do you have any questions? I have a hard copy of the manual. My buddy went up to the room and got it. So, this is, this is kind of the thing I was talking about where you can have a, a drawing here and you can have all the information below where you can read it. You know, this will be in PDF format, so we'll be able to load it onto your LCD when you're working on your game. If the LCD doesn't work for some reason, you've got the hard copy. So that's kind of what I'm thinking. And then update this as we go. It'll be kind of like the software. We'll give a, a I'm thinking a hard copy and a, and a PDF update every time you, you add more information to the manual. And so you get back to, you know, points back here where we get to the circuit boards. And here's the you know the, the, the matrices for the for the uh, 50 volt coils or fuse locations schematics. I have one of the RGB LED boards here that I've put in. So you know it's going to be it's a lot of work to get all these in. They come to that play field when we lift it up many times. There's a heck of a lot of circuit boards and things in there. So a lot of work left to do, but we plan on updating it as we go. I don't have to have the manual finished when the first game comes out. Thank God. And so I can update that and send you hard copy and, and electronic updates. And, and you can just pull these pages out of your whatever binder that we put them in and add the new ones in and have the latest, greatest manual. So thank you guys. We appreciate everything.